Radio. Ta -da -da -da. Hi everyone. Welcome <laughs> to our deep dive today, which is going to start in the deepest, darkest depths of the Wirral here in the UK. It's going to travel across to the USA. We're going to look at the mighty Wurlitzer. We're going to look at the very first talkies. And then we're going to take the rest of our deep dive into the deepest, darkest jungles of Skull Island and finish at the very top and then the bottom of the Empire State Building. Quite a programme today. And I'm really looking forward to sharing everything on it with all of you. So allow me a couple of quick sound checks. Well, we know that the mighty Wurlitzer is working. If I press this pedal, I should get a nice tremolo effect. Splendid. OK. <laughs> So I hope you're all having a good afternoon out there. Thank you so much for joining me. This, of course, is not the start of the lecture. That will be in about seven minutes' time. Uh, and this is just me popping up to say hello to all of you, checking that the sound is working. Uh, getting quite excited, actually, about this particular broadcast. You probably already tell. I am a huge, huge fan of film music. I love talking about it. There is so much to talk about. And, in fact, next week's session, which I'll tell you all about at the end, it, again, it's just going to take things up a notch. It's, it's, it's what producers would expect with sequels, isn't it? The first one last week, well, that was a bit wow and, and exciting. This is the sequel, so everything's got to be bigger and better. Next week, well, we take it to a whole new level. The classical origins of film music, part three. But in the meantime, I think we should make sure we've got everything working. So uh, it, I think I might, just in case I need to use it, let's have a big... Actually, we need a bigger sound than that, don't we? That is a leitmotif. That is a bit of music associated with a particular character. In case you haven't already gathered who we're going to be meeting later on. Well, who'd have thought he'd have ever turned up here on the channel, but you saw him just now playing the organ. King Kong himself will be in our broadcast. Where else on the internet could you have a channel that features the sublime music of Handel and Purcell and Mozart? We have pieces like The Peanut Vendor. We have songs based on ringtones and even King Kong. It's all in here, everyone, here on Home Choir. Now, look, let me welcome everyone who is here watching later on. Literally hundreds of you watch and enjoy the Home Choir broadcasts after they've streamed live. And I want to thank every single one of you who watches our shows. And if you send it on to someone else so that they enjoy it and they watch it too, well, then I want to thank you uh, twice as much because you are helping grow this channel. And to everyone who subscribed recently, welcome. I do hope you enjoy it. And if you haven't subscribed, if you're one of the nearly 50% of people who watches our regular broadcast and you haven't clicked that subscribe button, well, I hope today, by the end, you'll feel we've earned your subscription because it doesn't cost you anything. All you've got to do is move that mouse pointer across and go click on subscribe and it'll change colour. That's all that's all that'll happen. And it means that you'll get a notification. If you click that little bell next to it, you'll get a notification in your email every time we go live or we post something new. But otherwise, that's all that happens. And you grow our channel. And we're heading for 4,000 subscribers, hopefully before Christmas. Let's see if we can get there, folks. That would be fabulous. And if you can help us today, that would be greatly appreciated. Now, let's see who else is here in the cinema who's sitting at the back. Well, it's, of course, everyone who's watching, but not necessarily in the live chat. I do hope you enjoy, even if you're right at the back of the cinema doing whatever it is you want to do at the back. Welcome. And hello to Helene and Bill and Val in California. Hello to Sue and Tony and Sally and Annie and to Maureen. Hello to Harry and June. Hello to Anne and Nikki and to Charlotte and to Linda and to Huyen and Val and Katie and everyone else watching but not chatting today. And then Everyone else here is waiting for the show to start and having a nice little chat with their next door neighbours. I even hear a bit of rustling as people are tucking into uh, perhaps a bag of sweeties or some popcorn. And just I hope you've brought enough for the entire class, if that's the case. Uh, there may well be ice cream served down the front at the intermission. But in the meantime, let me welcome everyone who is here 
chatting away. So hello, Alison. Hello, Carolyn. Hello, Chris. Hello, Christine. Hello, Colette. Hello, Liz. Hello, Emma. Hello, Fiona. Hello, Gainer. Hello, Anna, who is here moderating for us today. Hello, Angela. Hello, Janet. Hello, Jean. Hello, Jill. Hello, Jill. Hello, Kitty. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Linda. Hello, Mags. Mags, this one will be particularly up your street. Let's talk about the organ. Hello, Michael. Hello, Nicola. Uh, hello, Nikki watching later on. Hello, Patricia. Hello, Sean. Hello, Soraya. Hello, Susanna. Hello, Valda. Hello, Wendy. Hello, all of you. You are all so very, very welcome. Uh, and Carolyn, happy birthday. Is it today? Yes, it is today. We shall be singing happy birthday for everyone who's celebrating their birthday. But a uh, little... Uh... <laughs> wanting to use that sound for the last two and a half years everyone it's just such a joy so how is everyone doing there ice cream sold from the tray in my local cinema and passed along the road well just as it should be emma fantastic there are cinemas uh, not too far from me where you can order food to your chair and you basically get the app up and you say i want to have a hot dog and i want to have a beer and so on and you pay and they bring it to your seat i'm not sure what i feel about that um, I, I certainly don't like sitting next to someone who's getting like a full three course dinner uh, as you're trying to enjoy the film. But you know, all, it takes all sorts, doesn't it, ladies and gents, as we're going to discover today, because today's show, well, my goodness me, there's, it's absolutely packed, jam packed. You're going to get to hear some amazing music, some played live, some recorded, uh, but all of it is world changing. And next week is more of the same. So how is everyone doing? If anyone else has joined us, hi, Patricia. Lots of people wishing Carolyn a happy birthday. Well, I know we've got uh, birthdays today. It's also Mia and Linda's birthday. So we're going to wish them a very happy birthday shortly. And uh, yes, I hope you're all having a good time. I had to let you all know, of course, that those of you that are following me uh, in my other projects, we launched Game Choir this week, which is going really well. We've had thousands sign up and hundreds already send in their recordings. I hope everyone out there watching is going to support us and be part of it. Go to gamechoir.com, sign up and just record this very short little chant. I was on BBC Radio Somerset just over an hour ago, and it, I have to say it was one of the best interviews I've had with a BBC journalist um because jenna over there she took her time she she chatted to me for about 10 minutes asked me all sorts of questions really seemed to engage with the project and unlike some of the more recent interviews which were a little on the short side and didn't i think quite understand what we were doing uh, i felt really that she understood it and felt really supported by it. so jenna thank you very much for that interview if you haven't heard it it's on bbc sounds of course for the next 24 hours so brilliant thank you everyone who's done that well i think we should get started it's, uh, we've got to have the trailers first, of course. Um, but in the meantime, I think we should sing Home Choir. And as we've got the mighty Wurlitzer, here, it's a shame to waste it. Well, then we will have uh, the F major Home Choir today, which you can sing on an F, an A, a C. And uh, you can help me sing this and start the show. Here we go, everyone. Nice deep breath. And... Uh... <laughs> And a very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Home Quiet. And today, it's a non-singing session. It is one of our deep dives. Before we get into it, though, we have to have the trailers. Of course, we've got to have the trailers. Coming soon to a theatre slash YouTube channel near you. We have our fun Friday. And this week, well, we're going to weave together some of the threads that we've spun in past fun Fridays. We're going to learn a little song called Mango Mango, which goes Mango, 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 Mango. Amongst other things. It's a song that my children taught me. They learned at Youth Choir and uh, I absolutely love it. You're going to have so much fun learning it. So that is Fun Friday. And then Sing Sunday. We're going to sing a, a, a beautiful mix. You can see here from the image I've uh, I've created using Mid Journey. It is a beautiful mix. All sorts of different styles and genres, but all united. In fact, they are beautiful bits of choral music. Now, of course, you, everything you need to know to be a member of Home Choir, you just need to go to our website, homechoir.org, fill in the form to register for the email newsletter, and you're done. That's all you have to do. If you tell us when your birthday is, we will, of course, sing Happy Birthday for you. 
you on your special day. And today we're celebrating because it is Mia's birthday, it's Linda's birthday, and it is Carolyn's birthday. So to all three of you, I'm going to go back to the mighty Wurlitzer console. We are going to sing happy birthday for all three of you before we start our lecture today. So nicely breath, uh, deep breath, everyone. There's your notes. A one, two. Happy birthday to you. to all of you. Hope you have a fantastic day. So everyone, as we have been for the last few weeks, this is a deep dive. This is our music lecture series aimed at absolutely everyone. You don't have to be a music academician in order to, that's not even a word, <laughs> an academic musician, uh, in order to be able to appreciate these lectures. They're aimed at absolutely everyone. And this particular subject is one that is near and dear to my heart. This is film music. And most of us can whistle at least a few film tunes. And chances are, throughout today, you'll hear about composers who wrote some of those tunes that you know so well. And this is not the image I shared with you last week. It was uh, a rather dry image of a lady sat at an organ console. But as the talk has taken shape this week, well, it's been very clear we need to pay reference to another enormous figure. Not just the mighty Wurlitzer, but the mighty Kong himself. So let's jump in at the very start. Welcome, everyone, to our sequel presentation, the second in a series of deep dives all about the classical origins of film music. Last week we began in silence and burst into sound with the earliest film music played by pianists in those rather run-down tatty Nickelodeons. And this week, in the next thrilling instalment, we will look at a fascinating story that starts in Birkenhead on the Wirral. It takes in sabotage, intrigue, threats of war, a genius fleeing persecution, all the way to the jungles of Skull Island before finally plummeting off the Empire State Building quite a journey. Come with me, ladies and gentlemen, and let's meet this chap here. Now, if there ever was the epitome of a modern major British organist, well, it's this chap here. He, he, he looks the part, and believe you me, this is the organist's organist. Everyone, this is Robert Hope Jones, who was born in 1859 and died in 1914. He's an English musician uh, who is considered to be the inventor of the modern theatre organ in the early 20th century. He was born and brought up in the Wirral, uh, in particular Birkenhead near Liverpool and he was a very successful local organist with a keen interest in technology particularly electrical engineering and whilst he played the organ at various churches at weekends having been brought up uh, in this tradition his day job was working for the telephone company which of course in the late 19th century was very active in laying new lines and developing new technologies and because he was so interested in electrical engineering he is actually credited with coming up with a whole load of different uh, technological innovations that we still use today including the very first compressors which were used in handsets and headsets in order to take your voice and amplify it so it had enough clout and power to be heard by the people at the other end and variants on this technology are still used today he also invented something called the diaphone now we'll hear more about this later on in the context of the mighty Wurlitzer but its more common use and is still in use today was as a foghorn the diaphone is able to produce deep powerful tones that can travel vast distances. Now, in about 1889, Hope Jones resigned from the telephone company to devote himself to improving the church organ, which is a subject that he'd been really quite occupied with for much of his spare time for years. Now, at first, Hope Jones devoted himself really to the, the brains of the operation. He'd come up with the innovations and he would uh, employ and license a score of organ builders who would carry out and implement his inventions. But as these organ builders didn't really have, I suppose, the technical know-how to be able to do this correctly quite often, and many of the results of these early uh, relationships proved unsatisfactory, he entered the field as an organ builder himself. Now, unfortunately, this meant he became a rival and a competitor to many of those who'd worked for him and had previously profited from his inventions and many of them became openly hostile and abusive and you can see why his new inventions were going to put them out of work this often meant things like the console where the keys are kept 
was separate from the actual organ itself. So the console could be anywhere in the church and the electrical action would trigger the pipes. This, amongst other major innovations, made him a target for all sorts of attacks, including against his electrical knowledge, his musical taste, his voicing ability in his playing, his financial standing and even his personal character, leading him to flee to America ultimately, but not before making some fairly significant sales here in the UK. And in the year 1895, what was practically the first ever Hope Jones electric organ sold was set up here in St George's Church, Hanover Square in London. And those in Choir of the Earth will be very familiar with this church as they have sung quite recently along with the new organ there. But this first Hope Jones organ created a huge furor. Uh, and that was cut short by a fire which destroyed the organ and much of the tower of the church. With curious timing, literally almost immediately after this fire had happened, attention was directed to, and I'm going to read this quote, the danger of allowing amateurs to make crude efforts at organ building invaluable in historic churches and to the great risk of electric actions. Now, there was a substantial police investigation and in the end, arson was the conclusion. And so the authorities of the church ordered from Hope Jones a similar organ to take the place of one that had been destroyed. And the console for this Hope Jones organ is still in St George's Hanover Square. And so you can see Hope Jones' time in the UK was really uh, quite much under threat and he fled to the USA where, uh, because he wasn't actually a very good businessman, he ended up working for the Wurlitzer Company, a nascent organ company in the USA, and he developed what then became known as the Mighty Wurlitzer, these, this enormous organ which could be installed into the movie theatres of the early 20th century, and it could take the place of a 25-piece orchestra and a rhythm section, and Philip Hope Jones's credited with inventing and developing several key voices which were only ever used in theatre organs. If you've ever heard a theatre organ playing along with a movie, you know exactly the kind of sounds I mean. The tibia clouser, which is a large double-stop flute which typically has quite a fast tremolo on it. The diaphone, as we saw earlier on, the foghorn, which is a powerful bass stop with a moving resonator which creates these deep, threatening sounds which would be completely out of place in a church but are perfect for the movie theatre. He also developed, uh, this is an incredible innovation, uh, close imitations of several orchestral instruments. So I've got a huge list here, and just to choose a few at random, the marimba, the xylophone, the harp, cathedral chimes, the bass kettle and snare drums, gongs, tambourines, strings, trumpets, as well as uh, sound effects to use with silent films, including the doorbell, bird call, auto horn, sleigh bells, train whistles, thunder, galloping hooves, hooves even a grand piano, all accessible from the console. So the mighty Wurlitzer became a huge seller in the early 20th century, particularly the 1920s, to create this vast orchestral sound without the cost or space requirements of an actual ensemble, because you could put the organ console anywhere in the theatre. Most notably, they would be usually in front of the screen, in the pit, and would sometimes rise up grandly as the music played, but the pipes and the machinery itself was often placed behind the screen or up in the rafters so that the sound could fill the theatre, but there was plenty of space for seats, which of course is where the money was. Now you can see here, these consoles were absolutely huge. Uh, each of these keyboards is known as a manual, so you had four, sometimes five, even six manual keys uh, on these organs. You had vast pedal boards to be played with the feet and all of these different stops and sounds could be set up and programmed so that if you knew which film it was you were accompanying, well you could set it all up to, to uh, play beforehand and then you would just play along. Now I want to show you first of all a clip from a fantastic video on this channel here, the MN Original channel. I've linked to all of the videos in today's lecture in the description, and I urge you and encourage you to go subscribe to their channels and watch the full videos because they are very, very interesting, illuminating. And this is all about the Wurlitzer Theatre Organ. Here is our first clip, everyone. Enjoy. Tune sleigh bells. Cathedral chimes. A marimba. And when you put them all together, it's a lot of fun. Is 
isn't that just amazing? B built into the actual infrastructure of the theatre are the full range of instruments, but it's all controlled from this electrical console. So the mighty Wurlitzer was a key feature of these early movie soundtracks, these early movies, uh, including by Buster Keaton and by Charlie Chaplin, which, of course, were huge sellers. But it's not just the instrument. There was, of course, a whole infrastructure and ecosystem around these instruments, including books just like that one I showed you last week for pianists, but for organists, which featured descriptions and hints like this one following. So uh, you can see here in this uh, edition which you can find if you just Google that particular uh, that, that particular front page here, Theatre Organist Secrets PDF, you can see the whole thing. And uh, someone has written in here, you know, Snore, Laughter, Kiss, page three, Aeroplane, page five, Dog Bark, page eight. So you can see exactly how to achieve the effect. So if you have a look at Laughter, for example, there's some suggestions at the top as to some stops you might want to use. The Vox Humana, the human voice, for obvious reasons. That tibia I mentioned, which is that fast, fluttering sort of flute sound with tremolo. It says, the effect of a person or person's laughing will often literally make certain comedy scenes. It can be easily produced on most theatrical instruments starting a little above middle c strike a handful of keys all in the notes of an interval between a fifth or a sixth in the crisp staccato manner with the flat of the right hand like this repeat four to six times striking a third or so higher each time You can put a crescendo in with a swirl pedal. The difference between a man's and woman's laughter can be made by playing lower or higher, as we previously indicated. So this is really very specific uh, stuff to allow organists to accompany a film and to add delight to make the audience laugh. You'll see in a minute the effects that this has. This is a yell. This is a shout. With a flat of the hand, strike a handful of several keys in the upper register and slide the hand down across the keyboard in glissando fashion for about an octave. The attack should be made with a rolling motion of the hand. The idea not to strike the whole handful down at once, but rather to add more as the glissando is commenced. So it's something like this. Now notice the notes are really close together at the top. Like that. And that is a yell. It's best to have the swirl box open and a slight decrescendo. So something like this. Now, the effect need not necessarily be used only in scenes where a person is shown yelling or screaming, but may also be employed to good advantage, accompanying comedy falls, blows and sudden surprise or flight. So the amount of thought and care that was going into these sounds created by these organs was absolutely huge. I'm going to show you a little excerpt from a film. I do thoroughly recommend after this broadcast you go and you watch the full video, which is linked in the description. Please do subscribe to Russell Smith's channel. He's posted this. Uh, it's about a 15-minute presentation recorded in 2013 by the theatre organist David Johnson, who played this instrument in New South Wales in Australia. And just as you're listening, just note how much detail... David is able to put into the film how many of the action scenes and how many of the action uh, sync points where the music reflects what's going on screen he is doing. This is absolutely amazing. Here we go. You get the idea. The tension created by the music being played live really was transformative to these early films. But it was not to last, I'm afraid, everyone. Whilst the mighty Wurlitzer reigned supreme for a short time, just around the corner, a new kind of sound lurked. The advent of the talkies was upon us. And it was this film here, The Jazz Singer, which featured the first fully recorded soundtrack. 
And you might think, well, you know, the first time people heard singing in a film, they would have been amazed. But of course, they'd had recorded singing in films for a while. You could play a recording along with a silent film. Sometimes even films employed actors to stand behind the screen and talk along with the silent film. But it was never entirely in sync. It wasn't the singing of the jazz singer that people were most mesmerised by. It was the talking. It was the fact that Al Jolson, who was the star of The Jazz Singer, was ad-libbing in between songs, and you could clearly see it was his voice coming out of his mouth. This changed cinema forever. This had never been heard in a movie theatre before. The world would never be the same again. Now, this is another fabulous video, which I do uh, recommend. It's from the channel Pawful Popnecker. So do go and uh, and support Dear Pawful. You know, the world needs more Pawfuls. And do watch this video in its entirety. But I want you to watch this. This is the moment where the audience has heard Al Jolson's voice. And there's a lovely little Easter egg. Just listen to what the first real spoken words are ever in a movie. I love this. Here we go. That's what they say. Watch me. He's an angel. Of a joy. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. You want to hear Toot 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 Toot? All right. Hold on. Hold on. No, listen. Play Toot 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 Toot. Three chorus, you understand? And the third chorus, I whistle. Now give it to him hard and heavy. Go right ahead. Nothing but blue skies from now on. There you go. As I say, the first words in a talkie. You ain't heard nothing yet. He wasn't wrong, was he? Now, talkies, as they were known, were suddenly everywhere. And musicians, much like my screen here, were suddenly left in the dark. They lamented as their main source of income suddenly dissipated. Orchestras were disbanded in their thousands. They were no longer needed. Pianos in theatre fell out of favour. And in fact, even the mighty Wurlitzer, which had been installed at great expense only the, a few years previously, was relegated to the job of playing interval music and to providing a good background before the main scene started. And so you might think that, uh, well, that is, uh, that's the end of things. But no, things were just getting started. Not just with the advent of talkies upon us, the advent of the first true soundtracks was just around the corner. And it's largely thanks to this man here. With the world changed forever, it was time for a new breed of composers. Those who would compose intricate film scores, complete with those points, as you saw with the Wurlitzer, where the music would respond almost instantaneously to the action on screen, a technique known as either hit or sync points, where the music is synced to the action on screen. And enter this man here. This, everyone, is Max Steiner. Now, he was born in Vienna in 1888 and trained as a classical musician in the Austro-German Romantic style before moving to England to work as a conductor and a composer in 1907. And he was very, very successful, However, the outbreak of the First World War seven years later led to him being interred as an enemy alien. And it, that was nearly the end of his story. However, the Duke of Westminster himself was a fan of Steiner's music and he obtained papers to allow him and his wife to leave immediately for America. However, his property, his land and his money were confiscated. So Steiner and his wife arrived in New York in December of 1914 with a total of $32 to their names, nowhere to live, no jobs, but at least they had their freedom. So Steiner got a job orchestrating musicals, which was all he could get at the time. And because he was a musical genius, his reputation grew swiftly until he was being asked to, to score Broadway musicals and his reputation was golden. Now, from 1929 to 1937, he worked for RKO Pictures, first as an orchestrator and then as a composer. And whilst he was working for RKO, he was asked to work on a particular picture, one that itself was going to change movies forever. And it was this little picture here, King Kong. 
Now, this was a breakthrough picture in so many ways, not just from the musical point of view, but also from the way it was made and for its incredible, for the time, special effects, uh, it, it most notably overseen by the great Ray Harryhausen, whose special effects we all grew up watching and enjoying. His work with stop-motion animation changed movies forever. But it wasn't an immediate success, at least not in terms of the studio. The studio didn't like the special effects. They didn't like the story. And it was really quite clear when they were watching the rushes that the audience were being asked to make a huge leap of faith in order to understand, uh, to believe, and even to sympathise with this character of King Kong, which itself was an animated puppet, effectively. And so the score became a key part of the film. It added realism to an unrealistic film plot. And the studio's bosses, as I said, were very sceptical about the special effects. They were also initially sceptical about the need for an original score. They suggested using old tracks, maybe classical music, to save on the cost of the film. However, the producer of King Kong, a chap called Merriam C. Cooper, asked Max Steiner to score the film and said he would pay for the orchestra. And the studio agreed in order to do this. And I think the producer was a visionary at this point. He knew the power of music and it would unlock the film for audiences. Now, Steiner took advantage of this offer and used an 80-piece orchestra, the largest orchestra that had been used for any film score up until that point. He explained the film was made for music. According to Steiner, it was the kind of film that allowed you to do anything and everything, from weird chords and dissonances to beautiful melodies. He wrote the score in a total of two weeks, and the recording session alone cost around $50,000 in 1933. That's quite steep. Now, Steiner, with his classical, particularly this Austro-German romantic background, brought all the techniques of that era, plus, vitally, the techniques of German opera, most notably that of Wagner, whose music we discussed recently here on the channel. If you remember, Wagner pioneered several techniques in his operas, including Gesamtkunstwerk, which was the complete art form, combining music with art and drama and movement and acting, which of course is exactly what King Kong was, as well as leitmotif, this idea of these individual tunes which were associated with individual characters. And Steiner brought these techniques to bear with King Kong, the first time this had ever been done. And so this landmark of film scoring showed the power music has to manipulate emotions. Let's look at the first leitmotif here. I'm going to make sure I'm not using the uh, mighty Wurlitzer for this. So this is Kong's leitmotif, this 50-foot gorilla. And you can hear the 50-foot gorilla in every millisecond of this. So much power in three notes, chromatically descending, uh, all in the bass. It gives you that real sense of character, majesty, danger, threat, everything you needed. This was scored with the low brass and the low strings to give you these ominous three notes and give the audience a sense of expectation in what's to come in terms of both scope and terror. And this actually opens the uh, the overture, the opening credits to King Kong, which we're going to watch in just a moment. So you hear these threatening three notes, which then is followed by a brief fanfare before the music continues with a reference to the stolen love theme. Now, this is the movie's heroine, who's called Anne Darrow, played by the legendary Faye Ray. And her leitmotif is on the upper strings, and it is very closely related to the Kong theme. It has... It has the descending chromatic notes, but then a little scoop and a yearning figure at the end. So that is what comes after Kong. You have Kong, you have the fanfare, you have this grand, soaring, stolen love theme uh, for the Andaro slash Fay Ray character. You then hear the jungle dance, which is the music that's first heard on Skull Island when the main characters first land. <laughs> After the jungle dance and a second fanfare, as the credits fade and a quote about Beauty and the Beast fades up, you hear the Kong like motif return, but this time it's scored in a much more soft, lush, and romantic fashion. And with this, before there's even a frame of moving action on screen, we have a journey. Kong in the beginning is threatening, he meets 
uh, and Darrow, and he becomes a different character, he becomes sympathetic. And we learn all of this through the music without having to see anything on screen. And Steiner took these motifs and they constantly evolve throughout the music. They dramatically underscore the action and they make this almost impossible task of making a 50 foot tall animated gorilla into a sympathetic figure. They make this a realistic goal. And it's mainly because we as the audience are moved and in some ways manipulated uh, by this musical score. So let's watch the opening titles to King Kong. And this comes from the fabulous Movie Clips channel. Please go and watch this and do subscribe to their channel afterwards. We're very grateful for them putting these clips up. And listen out for each of these light motifs, particularly the Kong mo motif, which is threatening to begin with and then becomes lush and more sympathetic. Here we go. Motif, but so as I say, within the match of two minutes, you are introduced to all of the light motifs that you're going to need and. There's even some character development before you've seen a single scene. Now, I know some of you have never seen King Kong. I really do thoroughly recommend it to you. It is a remarkable film. The effects, even today, nearly 100 years later, still stand up. And it is still a really fascinating and compelling film. Obviously, it's obvious that it's not a real gorilla. But when you consider this is one of the first effectively science fiction fantasy films ever made it was a landmark film it changed the way we thought about motion pictures and ushered in a complete new era now at the very end spoiler alert but very famously kong climbs the empire state building uh to uh, to get, try and get away with the fey ray character with Anne darrow and is shot by biplanes and he falls tragically to his death now the music at this point takes on a completely different character we have come to know appreciate and even have some fondness for kong who's been horribly mistreated and it's this it's a bit like the frankenstein story uh where the monster to begin with is threatening but we feel sympathy and empathy for it by the end and so the music takes on a tragic turn the two themes of kong and the stolen love that's uh, the andaro character they interweave because they've become friends they've become companions they are beauty and the beast and as we watch this scene as kong falls from the empire state building again the score says so much you hear the descending notes as he falls you even without having to see kong land on the sidewalk you hear it in the score and then at the very very end the immortal line ah but it was beauty that killed the beast this kong leitmotif is treated with such tragedy and such pathos people were crying in the theatre for this animated 50-foot gorilla. So let's watch the very last scene from King Kong, and I would thoroughly urge you all to watch the whole thing. Here we go. A 
little burst of that stolen love light motif. That solo violin with a little bit of Andorra's music. My name's Denham. Just a moment. Oh, Lieutenant. Lieutenant, I'm Carl Denham. Carl Denham? Yeah. Denham? Well, that's the man that captured the monster. Well, Denham, the airplane's got him. Oh, no. It wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. Beauty killed the beast. So, everyone, that is a little bit of King Kong, a landmark score. Changed the way we thought of cinema. But that was not all that Max Steiner was going to do for our enjoyment, everyone. Steiner invented some of the techniques that are still used today. In fact, many of you, if you've ever recorded for Home Choir, Choir of the Earth, you have used a technique that Steiner invented. The level of precision for the music that Steiner was required to create was very, very hard to achieve with the technology there in the 1930s. So Steiner took his copy of the film that he was scoring to and used a pin to put small holes in the cells at regular intervals. This created a click in the projector, which he could use to write the music to. And later on, he could use that same click to conduct the orchestra when it was recorded. So Max Steiner completely by himself, without being asked to, developed and created the first click track. And he went on to compose for over 300 movies, became a legendary composer. His scores for, for films such as Gone with the Wind, Casablanca, A Summer Place, uh, Now Voyager, The Searchers, and so many more are considered absolute cornerstones of the genre. So thank you, Max for an amazing career. Now, we will continue our exploration of this fascinating topic next week in part three with the story of an amazing composer who was perhaps the greatest of all film composers in the Golden Age. His name was Erich Wolfgang Korngold. And it's fair to say that Robin Hood quite literally saved the life of this man and his family. And his impact on film music cannot be understated. I want to play you, just to finish today, I want to play you a little bit of a fanfare from a film called King's Row, which starred, amongst other people, Ronald Reagan, who... I wonder what happened to him. But if you have a listen to this... familiar what about this absolutely without corn gold we would have none of the big movie sounds uh, and the big movie scores by john williams and others so do join me next week for the third thrilling installment of the deep dives of the classical origins of film music. I really hope you enjoyed today. If you have, please do consider hitting the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for more and do share this with everyone as we want as many people as possible to come and enjoy learning about and sharing the excitement of music. Now, uh, can I also ask if, you, if it is possible, if you could please put your seats up, make sure you pick up all of your litter around you, popcorn wrappers and so on, because uh, we need to get the next people in for the next showing. And one more time, do please go and support the channels whose clips have enhanced our broadcast today. All the links are in the description, and I think it's a fascinating journey to go and explore to keep you on the edge of your seat ready for part three next week but in the meantime i'll be back on fun friday we have a superb program this week with mango mango and much much more and of course sunday we've got our sing sunday uh, for something completely different but in the meantime i'm going to see you soon take care folks bye bye